We are just learning about. There were animals all around. Moose, deer, muskrat, beaver, all used for food. In the fall time, if you looked up, you could see mallards and geese. They were shot for food in the fall time. As the moon rose, you could hear an owl. Stories were told, lessons were learned, it was laughter. It seems a far reach for us today to imagine such a simple life being on the ground on which we walk. There is beauty and simplicity, and simplicity and beauty. It is in remembering, it is in thinking and learning about the peoples that walked on the land where we walk today, that we acknowledge the people of the land that were here before us. Thank you, Pauline. Our first reader today, oh, pardon me, Gordon, our first harpist today <laughs> is our beloved Gordon. And how could we have music of the spoken word without Gordon? <laughs> I have been writing poetry for a number of years now, and I found that looking through what I've written is I have many poems about falling, which is something I have been doing. So I have brought one of my falling poems called Alley Oops. It's true, this story. I am walking down an alley, trusted walker in front of me, when the gravel at my feet comes up to attack me. It hits me on the forehead. It bites me on the toes. It sends my feet a flying, so my body down it goes. My head, it hits the alley wall, which makes a purple bump. My fist goes out to stop the fall and shatters with a thump. Blood roll flowing on the ground, fist bloodied by despair, heart pounding in my head, and what a mess my hair. I am gathered up upon my feet, my pains to stitch away, but I know I must defeat my foe another day. I look long to the day at last my foot no longer droops, because that day will be the end of all the alley-oops. 
Thank you. Speaking of alley oops here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to go over there. There's a little. I was encouraging Corrine to, to participate because she is a member of the Stroll of Poets and has many, many poetic gifts to share. So I, I don't think I quite twisted her arm, but I gave her the talk. <laughs> now, David Hawes, who many of us know here, is our next performer. And David, please come forward. Once again, a playwright, a poet, a musician, and um, a beloved character to many of us. And I've challenged him to come forward and put the fingers to that guitar. David. How's the sound? Yeah. Always get nervous. <coughs> this is a song which is basically an immigrant success story, kind of. It's actually about a mom and pop bootlegging team during Alberta's prohibition period from 1916 to 1923, down in Wetaskiwin, 40 miles south of here. Excuse me a second, I'm having. <coughs> no, we didn't want that happening when I'm singing. Okay. Um, this is called Volga Leather Dressing for reasons which will become apparent. There's a little shoe store down on West Railway Street where old Henry the cobbler sells things for your feet. He's got boots and shoes and laces, but his biggest blessing are the little green bottles he fills to the neck with Volga leather dressing. If you go down to a task one these days, you will not find West Railway Street. Uh, in the late 1940s, Wetaskiwin City Council decided a big place like Wetaskiwin needs a numbered street system, just like Edmonton. Blah! In 1914, well, in 1916, when the lads were off at war, Alberta banished liquor so folks couldn't drink no more. Old Henry reached for his recipe and, without fuss or messing, he warmed up a batch of the finest grade of Volga leather dressing. Henry and his wife Maria were from Russia, but they weren't Russians, they were Germans. Uh, the descendants of Germans who emigrated to Russia at the invitation of the Russian government in 1762. A lot of them got out. Also other ethnic groups, a lot of people got out of Russia in the late 1880s and early 1900s. Uh, Henry and Mariah ended up in Wetaskiwin. And after a couple of years, uh, they'd built up enough money for Henry to open a shoe store and cobbler shop, which was his trade from Russia. Always making more, but 
But in case a cop is eavesdropping, which you would find depressing, make sure you specify all you want is vulgar leather dressing. It's good for boots. Uh, what had happened was when Prohibition came in, Henry started distributing some good stuff to friends for a price. And word got around to people who were using the Canadian Pacific Railway between Edmonton and Calgary as kind of a commuter link between other small communities. And uh, so things went. fired the OCMP and brought in the Alberta Provincial Police with a specific mandate and specific task force to crack down on bootlegging. Blah! <laughs> One night with a new batch working up, Henry was out of town. His wife was keeping lookout when something made her frown. At the foot of the garden was a sight which she found most depressing. A solitary figure on watch for a sign of vulgar leather dressing. It could only be the APP on the hunt for illegal liquor. Every time that she looked out it made her heart beat quicker. But after a sleepless night, the dawn made her anxiety less. The scarecrow they'd left out last fall was not there after alcohol, nor vulgar leather dressing. Now that story is basically true, and as a matter of fact, I got the story of the night of the watchful scarecrow from old Mariah many years later. Um, she delivered it with gusto, much gestures, expressions, and laughter. Uh, she delivered it in the, that uh, kind of thick German accent that a lot of German immigrants developed in those days. I didn't have any trouble understanding her. My grandmother always talked to me like that. Thank you. Ah, oh, David, you're full of so many good stories. Now we have a hymn. Call us again. And Gordon is going to play that while you sing along on the with the words. And if you are so moved that you can light candles of joy and concern. Thank you. 
Gary Garrison, where did I put you? Hello. Gary Garrison is an old friend. I don't, I don't mean, I, I, I don't, <laughs> you didn't allow me. <laughs> a, a friend in the fact that we've been members of the Stroll of Poets and I think he predated me by a little while. Um, spoken word, music, voice, personality, killer blinks, uh, professional and so on. And if you have anything else to add, please feel free to do that. Gary. Okay, I think I'll let my uh, my songs speak for themselves. I got, I don't know why Audrey gave me a little bit more time than some of the other people, but I've got three songs. None of them are real long. Don't look at me. Look at <laughs> there was a vote. Nobody else here knows me. I don't think. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I've got three songs and the, the one I want to start with uh, was inspired by something I heard on the radio about a scientist, an atheist scientist, whose last words were, this should be interesting. <laughs> and I call it can you hear me okay? I, I call it the, uh, the archaeologist's final dig. The cancer ran its course, they killed off all the pain. I waited at the station for the outbound train. I hugged my son, kissed the grandkids one last time, but wonder wouldn't leave my scientific mine. The trains are coming, I don't need a bag. The trains are coming, I'm ready to go. The trains are coming, gotta get on board. So many things I gotta, I gotta, I just gotta know.
next one, I've, uh, I, I've written poems for patients at the U of A hospital as a volunteer for about 15 years. And uh, this is really the only song that's come out of that. I've got, I don't know how many hundreds of poems that have come out of it, but this is uh, a song that I wrote for a heart transplant patient. And it's called, I'll Never Breathe Another Breath Without You. and 
And this last one, um, it's called You Are the Glory, and I can't decide whether it's You Are the Glory or You Are the Glory, but I actually think it's both. And if I had more time, I would be glad to sing it with you and teach you how to sing it, because it's, there's actually a call and response part to it in the chorus, but uh, we'll have to just, really? I've got time? <laughs> okay, the, <clears throat> the chorus goes like this. The last line of the chorus changes every, every verse. sing a line and you sing it back to me and then we'll just do it like that it's just four short lines so you are the glory you are the glory you are the glory that enlivens everything okay that sounds good that'll make this a whole lot better like this. You are the glory of the morning when the sun comes up to play. The glory of sons and daughters who give their love away. The glory of the daffodils, the lilac scents of spring. The glory of that unseen power that enlivens everything. Here we go. You are the glory
are the glory. We are the glory. If only we would see. Well, thank you, Gary. You sounded like Huddy Ledbetter. <laughs> Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger, okay. I'll go. Uh, take your take your pick. Take your pick. Okay. Now, my next uh, reader was to be Naomi McElwraith, who many of you know from the genocide memorials. Her mother, unfortunately, is in the Misericordia, and she is there with her today. So, Jonesy, where are you? come up here young adult of big vigor and mystery and personality and oh my goodness you fill it in yourself <laughs> thank you how much time do i have you have five minutes okay <laughs> <laughs> well you know he's going to interpret that himself <laughs> hello everyone i'm jones harvey i go by any pronouns um the reason i asked how much time i have was because initially I picked a very long poem that was about 10 minutes long, and I was told it was too long. So I've picked a different one. Uh, but I am not a poetry writer. I am a poetry collector. I have lots of other arts, and I'm more than happy to leave that one for other people. But today, I've chosen my very favorite poem in the entire world. It is called Small, Kindnesses, Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamaris. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by. Or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't wanna harm each other. We wanna be handed our cup of coffee hot and say thank you to the person handing it to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder, for the driver and the red pickup truck to let us by. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What if these are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together, when we say, here, have my seat, Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. That was Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamaris. I think he took me too literally. I think that was under two minutes. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. We'll talk later. Now it gives me very, very great pleasure to introduce my protege, Danilo Budenko, who has walked into my house when he first came with his family, and he looked at my piano and he said, ah, and the rest is history. Would you like to introduce your, your just talking to you. Hello, my name is Danilo Budenko. I'm going to play three songs today. Our first song is Wednesday from a movie. Second one is my mom's favorite song. It's really beautiful. And last one, it's very close to you.
I want to present to Danny Lowell, the certificate on the occasion of his first public piano performance at the age of nine years at the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. of floodwaters, when the fact that the motion within atoms is kin to the motion of stars will be understood as spiritual and break down the barriers between us and them, us and animals, us and plants, us and microbes, us and watersheds, us and supernovas, us and whoever or whatever we're putting in the box that says, this isn't what we are. All of us need all of us to make it. The barriers between beings are lies. Just as stars can't exist without the atoms dancing in their cores, we cannot exist without each other. When the smoke clears, what will we see differently? Thank you. I think we should ask them to put that poem in our newsletter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Please, Corrine, would you give us our closing words? I promise not to fall. <laughs> So yeah, I'll you. <laughs> Let me take that for you. Yeah. Thanks. As a person who's dealing with my own uh, issues around getting up from chairs and things, I can resonate. <laughs> <clears throat> I did a Google search about on this topic, and I came up with this. The arts have proven to show healing powers as they connect with unique parts of our brain. Music has been found to have powerful effects on the mental and physical health of patients in hospitals and hospices. Studies show that music can reduce stress levels, improve moods, increase energy levels, reduce pain levels, and even speed up recovery time from illness or injury. I was witness to a dementia patient who played the piano and it was her role for family get togethers. In the nursing home where she lived, they would always convince her to play for sing-alongs. Playing the music would always bring her out of her dementia and allow her to remember songs she learned years ago. The healing words. Poetry can provide comfort and boost mood during periods of stress, trauma, and grief. 
Its powerful combination of words, metaphor, and meter help us better express ourselves <clears throat> and make sense of the world and our place in it. Different research studies have shown evidence that writing or reading poetry can be therapeutic for both patients dealing with illness and adversity, as well as their caregivers. So everyone go home and find a poem and read it to yourself today. That's your homework. I'm done. Are you done? <laughs> Are you done? Is it cooked or? No, I'm done. I've done my words. Thank you so much. And thank you for your help in the programming. Okay. Now I have to get down, do I? Okay. Whoa. Okay. What? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And that, my dears, is the uh, conclusion of our first music and spoken word, which I hope that you will support next summer and if anyone here has a poem i see some time on the clock and if you have something that you love please come forward and share it with us before the post -lead. come on i'll explain the bird too that's what it is that's for you darling Anyway, um, my Nana, when she was making salads for dinner, she would recite poetry. And she remembered the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And yes, start to front or start to end that she would end up. So I came home one day from school and said, I need to memorize a poem. And so she started with the ancient rhymer. <laughs> Oops, I'm going to break things. <coughs> Excuse me. So I said, like, mm, I don't, I, yeah, I don't think I'm going to remember all that, but wow, you do. And um, so she said, well, there's another one. And I remember it to this day, and it's the one I said in school. The one L llama, he's a priest. The two L llama, he's a beast. And I bet your pink pajama, there's no such thing as a three L llama. <laughs> Oh, that's a challenge. Is there anyone else that has a poem? <laughs> Jones, come on back up here. And meanwhile, think, think, think. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon or the cremation of Sal McGee or something like that. Sorry, George. Thank you. And so is the mic. <laughs> I would hope so. All right, I do have my longer one. I read this one recently uh, and I loved it so much that I took this artist's uh, poetry collection out of the library and I haven't read it yet, so I'm excited for that. But this one is called My God, It's Full of Stars by Tracy K. Smith. One, we like to think of it as parallel to what we know, only bigger. One man against the authorities or one man against a city of zombies. One man who is not, in fact, a man, sent to understand the caravan of men now chasing him, like red ants let loose down the pants of America. Man on the run. Man with a ship to catch, a load to drop. This message going out to all of space. Though, maybe it's more like life below the sea. Silent, buoyant, bizarrely benign. Relic of an outmoded design. Some like to imagine a cosmic mother watching through a spray of stars, mouthing yes, yes, as we toddle towards the light, biting her lip if we teeter at some ledge, longing to sweep us to her breast, she hopes for the best. While the father storms through adjacent rooms, ranting with the force of kingdom come, not caring anymore what might snap us in its jaw. Sometimes what I see is a library in a rural community. All the tall shelves in the big open room, 
and the pencils in a cup at circulation, gnawed on by the entire population. The books have lived here all along, belonging for weeks at a time to one another in the brief sequence of family names, speaking, at night mostly, to a face, a pair of eyes, the most remarkable lies. Two. Charlton Heston is waiting to be let in. He asked once politely, a second time with force from the diaphragm. The third time he did it like Moses, arms raised high, face an apocryphal white, shirt crisp, suit trim. He stoops a little coming in, then grows tall. He scans the room, stands still until I gesture, then he sits. Birds commence their evening chatter. Someone fires charcoals out below, He'll take a whiskey if I have it, water if I don't. I ask him to start from the beginning, but he only goes halfway back. That was the future once, he says, before the world went upside down. Hero, survivor, God's right-hand man, I know he sees the blank surface of the moon where I see a language built from brick and bone. He sits straight in his seat, takes a long, slow, high thespian breath, then lets it go. For all I know, I was the last man on this earth. And may I smoke? The voices outside soften. Planes jet past, heading off or back. Someone cries that she does not want to go to bed. Footsteps overhead. A fountain in the neighbor's yard babbles to itself and the night air lifts the sound indoors. It was another time, he says, picking up again. We were pioneers. Will you fight to stay alive here, riding the earth toward God's knows where? I think of Atlantis buried under ice, gone one day from sight, the shore from which rose now glacial and stark. Our eyes adjust to the dark. Three, perhaps the error is believing we're alone, that the others have come and gone, a momentary blip, when all along space might be chock full of traffic bursting at the seams with energy we neither feel nor see, flush against us, living, dying, deciding, setting solid feet down on planets everywhere, bowing to the great stars that command, pitching stones at whatever are their moons. They live wondering if they are the only ones, if they are the only ones knowing the wish to know and the great black distance they, we, flicker in. Maybe the dead know, their eyes widening at last, seeing the high beams of a million galaxies flicking on at twilight, hearing the engines flare, the horns lo not letting up, the frenzy of being. I want to be one notch below bedlam, like a radio without a dial, wide open so everything floods in at once, and sealed tight so nothing escapes, not even time which should curl in on itself and loop around like smoke, so that I might be sitting now beside my father as he raises a lit match to the bowl of his pipe for the first time in the winter of 1959. Four, in those last scenes of Kubrick's 2001, when Dave is whisked into the center of space, which unfurls in an aurora of orgasmic light, before opening wide like a jungle orchid for a love-struck bee, then goes liquid paint in water and the ga gauze wafting on out and off before finally the night tide, luminescent and vague, swirls in and on and on. In those last scenes, as he floats above Jupiter's canyons and seas, over the lava-strewn plains and mountains packed in ice, that whole time he doesn't blink. In his little ship, blind to what he rides, whisked across the wide screen of unparceled time, who knows what blazes through his mind? Is it still his life he moves through, or does that end at the end of what he can name? On set, it's shot after shot till Kubrick is happy. Then the costumes go back on their racks and the great gleaming set goes black. Five, when my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said, they worked like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold, a bright white. He'd read Larry Nivern at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years, when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. 
My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked and his arms would rise as if we were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di, Rock, Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time the optics jibed, we saw to the edge of all there is. So brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. That was My God, It's Full of Stars by Tracy K. Smith. <clears throat> Much longer than the first one. <laughs> I think he's declaring victory over me. I have room for one more two minute poem. Pam? So my poem is just a little benediction. It's called Praying Hands. We are woven together like fingers, clasped together in an interdependent cup, gingerly holding our collective souls. We wiggle and strain at times held together merely by the sweat of our struggle. The fabric consists of many strands, none more important than the next. The colors create a rich tapestry. The absence of one creates the same calamity as the other. The loss just as devastating to the health of its contents. We weep the same color. The loss creates the same pain and sadness. We cleave to one another and incubate the souls. Collectively, they rise and develop and become the life-giving bread the mana, able to fill the bellies of many, able to magnanimously nourish more so they can give and gain strength and huddle and cleave and generate more cups, filling Mother Earth's pantry with the harvest of love. And before we have the posters, I'd like to take to thank Mitch and Andrew and Gordon and everyone who helped make this uh, service work, including uh, Karen, who, who saved my uh, printer uh, concerns. <laughs> thank you, Gordon, it's all yours. Please gather to hold hands and look into each other's eyes and let's sing Carry the Flame. Okay. 